Well, continuing our discussion of corporate governance, uh, we turn our attention now to factors affecting stakeholder relationships. And we can divide these into a couple of groups. Uh, one is market factors. And this may include pressure from what we call activist shareholders, shareholders um, outside perhaps a hedge fund or a large invest investor, uh, an institution, may take a large position in the stock and uh, um, their goal is to make some changes which they believe will increase the value of the company. And we refer to these as activist shareholders. Uh, another market factor is the threat of a hostile takeover. If management is doing a poor job managing the assets of the company in terms of making returns and creating value for shareholders, then one thing in the marketplace that can happen is a hostile takeover is a group will buy up enough shares to take control of the company. And uh, the hostile in hostile takeover uh, means that it's not really um, um, brought about by the company, but these outside investors. And uh, um, so uh, they'll buy up a bunch of shares and get rid of existing management. That's kind of what makes it a hostile takeover. And the idea is to put in management with new policies, better utilize the assets of the firm, make better capital allocation decisions, and increase returns and value. Now some non-market factors include the legal environment, uh, communications channel, I guess one of the more recent changes is how social media has been uh, used and uh, makes it a lot easier um, for those with differing ideas to convey those to shareholders rather than having to get the list of all the shareholders and mail something out and things like this. So there's increased the dissident shareholders' ability to influence public opinion and attract votes from other shareholders. And third-party ratings of corporate governance, there's a couple few companies out there now that give ESG ratings to corporations. And uh, um, many investors are using these and using ESG factors in making their investment decisions. Well, we've got an LOS here. What are the risks of poor corporate governance? Well, um, I guess the number one is to decreased company value if they have weak controls, weak audits, weak board oversight of senior management, uh, poor or fraudulent accounting, of course. And besides just direct uh, value effects, we might have legal and reputational effects if a company like, uh, oh, puts something on their cars to trick all the emissions tests or something like that. It might be a little bit of a blowback on the uh, company. And when there's lax oversight of management, this leads to suboptimal risk levels. We talked about that difference in uh, goals in terms of risk between management and shareholders. There may be related party transactions, so the firm is doing business with certain individuals who are actually involved in the decision making. That's certainly not a good uh, uh, situation. Or if the compensation is set up so that the incentives of management are not lined up with the company goals, this is going to lead to trouble in suboptimal performance and, and lower value as well. Um, in terms of ownership, sometimes we see holdings by affiliated companies or institutions. We mentioned activist shareholders. And uh, often the company's founders might have different shares. We've seen this in, in tech companies in recent memory where they'll have like a, a super voting shares and shares with just one vote. So we've got two different classes. So the founders can keep enough votes to still control the company without actually owning 51% of the economic value of the company because they've got these super voting shares. In terms of the board composition, uh, you really want to keep in mind that independence of directors, independence from management, uh, so that there's not conflicts of interest there, are a key point when evaluating uh, boards of directors. And also, I guess it goes without saying, it would be nice to have a board where there are members with expertise suited to the company's strategy. And uh, 
Um, that may mean there's very strong technology people or marketing people or people with uh, experience in the industry or related industries uh, or with finance or with uh, accounting if they're going to serve on the audit committee. In terms of management compensation, we mentioned at least twice so far that it should be aligned with the company's strategy. It should promote the company's strategy. And one of the questions that come up, comes up is, is, do they give them a long-term focus or a very short-term, quarter-to-quarter, meet your earnings estimate sort of focus? And if their compensation is stable over time, we may find that although it's set up with a salary and very significant bonus structure, if they're always getting their bonus, then perhaps the performance targets are being set too easy and this bonus structure is not really having the desired effect in terms of the incentives that it offers. In terms of shareholder rights, weaker with staggered boards. Now, a staggered board says, well, we aren't going to have all these elections at once. We're going to spread them out over a number of years. So if we've got 12 uh, directors, we might have uh, uh, elect three of them every year over a staggered over a four-year period. And so the reason this is not good for shareholder rights is it makes it hard to change enough members of the board in the short term to have an effect. And this, along with what we call anti-takeover provisions, uh, anti-takeover provisions make it really hard for a hostile takeover to do its job of taking over the company and redeploying the assets or reworking the strategy in a meaningful and, and profitable way. And so those are considered not in shareholders' interests. And these dual share classes certainly are there to, uh, um, for the benefit of the founders, not for the benefit of shareholders overall. Now we get to the SG in ES, or the ES in ESG. We've been covering the G. Uh, so our environmental and social considerations, these are coming into play more and more. In the public view and uh, the view of companies, um, but also shareholders as well. And so ESG investing broadly says, well, we're going to consider these environmental, social, and governance factors when making investment decisions. This has also been referred to as sustainable investing or responsible investing. Make it sound, uh, they make it sound like nothing but good. Now, the idea has come up, well, can they make decisions based on these ESG factors when really their job is to look out for their, share, their uh, clients' interests if they're managing an investment portfolio? And the... Uh, uh, U.S. Department of Labor, um, who uh, has responsibility under the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, these are the regulations that cover the management of pension funds, for example. And they say, well, this ESG focus could conflict with the fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of the, client, interests of the clients under ERISA. And so what the U.S. Department of Labor said, well, this is not necessarily a violation for pension fund managers to consider ESG factors. But look at the way they put it. They said, when evaluating a security's risk and return, well, you see, that's the overall framework they're working in already. Okay? They're looking at individual securities and evaluating their risk and return and then putting them together in, in into an efficient portfolio within the parameters of the risk tolerance and uh, uh, required returns and all of that. So that's not really a leap. If it affects risk and return, sure, use it. That's the first part. The second part says, well, if you're choosing between two investments that have otherwise similar risk characteristics, risk and return characteristics, then you can use the ESG factors. So they're saying, if there's two securities, and they're kind of otherwise, we don't say identical here, they say otherwise similar. But if we can't distinguish between them based on risk and return, then we could turn to ESG factors to make our investment decision and avoid uh, 
gun manufacturers or tobacco stocks or, 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 or mining companies that, that chew up the environment, things like this. Now, in investment analysis, we've got some terminology for you here, and it's not too tough terminology, but it's something you need to be uh, familiar with for the exam. Uh, the first is negative screening and sometimes called exclusionary or norms-based. It's always nice to have three names for something to remember. Uh, and this, just focus on the negative exclusionary thing, excluding companies or sectors based on ESG factors. So that negative screening would say, okay, let's take out the tobacco stocks or the liquor stocks or the defense stocks or whatever it is. Uh, positive screening, on the other hand, looks at it from a different point of view and says, well, let's identify companies that have positive ESG. So these companies with the, the good ESG ratings, for example, that would be positive screening. Now, positive screening, within this, there's something called best-in-class approach. And so rather than with positive screening just going, oh, well, here's the 50 firms with the highest ESG ratings, well, they may all end up in the, a lot in the same industries. They'd be clustered, and that would mess up the risk profile um, of the portfolio and its ability to match a, a benchmark return. So with the best-in-class approach, they look in each industry or sector and say, well, within this industry, which firms have the best ESG practices? And so the idea of this is we can maintain our industry or sector weightings to match the benchmark so we haven't taken another dimension of risk as we might if we just used positive screening. Uh, ESC, ESG integration or incorporation. These are broad terms for integrating quantitative and qualitative characteristics that represent good ESG management. So that's the idea. Well, just like it sounds, we've integrated ESG into the uh, stock selection process. Thematic investing means an investor is uh, um, choosing securities based on a specific ESG factor. So perhaps somebody really wants to promote alternative energy. So their thematic investing would be investing in companies that were um, moving in that direction. Impact investing, seeking to have a pro make a profit while having a positive impact on a social or environmental goal. So not too much different from uh, what we just discussed. But within impact investing, uh, we have a couple more terms. Green finance, uh, achieve economic growth while reducing pollution. So, yeah, we want to make money, yeah, we want to grow, but we want to take a long-term view of how much damage we're doing to our planet. Green bonds just refers to bonds that are issued to fund these environmentally friendly projects. 